ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونستهديه ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اللهم صل وسلم وبارك عليه وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا اما بعد يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته وَلَا تَمُوتُنَّ إِلَّا وَأَنْتُمْ مُسْلِمُونَ My brothers and sisters in Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in this verse, O you who have believed, have the taqwa of Allah, as is rightfully due to Allah, and do not die except as Muslims. To proceed, there is a verse in the Qur'an that I've been reflecting on for the past few days and perhaps even few weeks in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to tell the people of the book. And this happened after many discussions and perhaps even arguments, debates were happening between the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the people of the book, and the people of the book who came and visited from Najran. And they couldn't come to an agreement. They couldn't, there was no solution to the words People are saying one thing, the other people are saying one thing, they're talking over each other, nobody, we're not coming to a result. The conversations are not productive at all. And so in this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands the Prophet wasallam to tell the people of the book to come to common ground. Because without common ground, we can have no discussion. There can be no conversation. We won't agree on anything because we don't even agree on the principles that we're discussing. The initial principles are off. So how can we have any productful conversation? How can we achieve any result when our initial starting point is just completely so far off? What is the verse? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Prophet وسلم, in the Quran to tell the people of the book, قُلْ يَا أَهْلَ الْكِتَابِ تَعَالَوْ إِلَىٰ كَلِمَةٍ سَوَاءٍ بَيْنَنَا وَبَيْنَكُمْ Say, O people of the book, come to a word of sawa, meaning a common word, something we can agree upon between us and you. Allah na'budu illa Allah, that we shall not worship except Allah. Wala nushrika bihi shay'a, and we shall not associate partners with Him at all. Wala yattakhda ba'duna ba'dun arbaba min dun Allah, and we will not take each other as lords besides Allah. Because obviously they took Jesus Christ as a Lord. They took many of their priests and rabbis, etc. as Lords because they deified them and whatnot. And that they would legislate that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself did not legislate. فَإِن تَوَلَّوْ If they can't even agree upon this, فَقُولُوا شَهَدُوا بِأَنَّا مُسْلِمُونَ Then bear witness that we are Muslims. That's it. This is an important principle when having a discussion and a dialogue with anybody. That first we have to come to common ground. If we have no common ground, then we're not going to reach a good result. And my brothers and sisters, in Islam, with the election going on, my fear, wallah, is not who's going to be elected. This is actually, <laughs> ultimate dominion is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he says this multiple times in the Quran. And if a Muslim doubts this, then that's an issue with their iman. تَبَارَكَ الَّذِي بِيَدِهِ الْمُلْكِ وَهُوَ عَلَىٰ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٍ Glorified be he who in his hand is all dominion. And he is capable of doing everything. This is why first and foremost, a Muslim has to believe that all dominion is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that he is the king and he is the rightful king. And that we have to submit to that among all of the other attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's number one. My fear, however, is that we now live in a country deeply divided. And unfortunately, even Muslims have succumbed to this division. And in my opinion, a lot of it is manufactured division. It's actually not real inherent division. And this is why even if you encounter a Muslim who you differ with upon who they voted for, or who they didn't, you have to come to common ground with them if you want to have a good dialogue and a good conversation. And unfortunately, like we said, if we cannot agree upon certain principles, we're not going to achieve much. This is why, wallah, the whole idea of this khutbah today is for us to seek common ground with those who differ with us, whether they be Muslim or non-Muslim. Because like I said, my fear is this rift that has been growing and growing in this country of ours. And if we do not take care of it, it's only going to get worse, regardless of who's president. 
When they say we live in two Americas, this is true. People have, they differ of course politically, but even when you have a conversation, you'll realize you're dealing with two different paradigms, two different mindsets, two different even set of facts, where one will say everything that you do is fake news, and the other will say everything that you do is crazy and, and outrageous. The only way to resolve this is with outreach and with dialogue. How do we know this? Allah subhanahu wa now here's the thing. In this story that I'm about to mention, they didn't achieve the result, but at least they reached out. It's the story of Ashab al-Sabt, the people of the Sabbath. In the Quran it's mentioned, in Surah Al-A'raf and other places as well it's referenced. In which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that there are three groups of people. And we want to be among the best group. And this is the whole idea insha'Allah ta'ala. One group, of course, was the group who actually transgressed. They did the wrong, but they justified it in their minds. Meaning they thought that the ends justify the means. And this is, of course, wrong in Islam. And this is why a lot of people who support what's going on and all these travesties, they say, well, I know that all of this is wrong, but I support the ends. And this is, of course, false from an Islamic paradigm. But these people, they said, they wanted to go fishing. When they would fish on every day other than Saturday, they would barely find any fish, barely any sustenance. Of course, they did find some sustenance, but this shows us that human greed a lot of times overwhelms the people and it clouds their judgment and they do bad things. When they would go and they would see the fish on Saturday, in which they were prohibited from fishing, there's a ton of fish and it was a big fitna for them. So they try to find a loophole, you know, a way around all of this. And we know the story by putting their nets on Friday and then collecting the nets on, Saturday, on Sunday. Therefore, technically, they didn't fish on Saturday. But of course, all the fish that got stuck in the net were from the fish that came on Saturday. That's group number one. Everybody agrees this group transgressed. The two other groups, one group said, we have to talk to these people. We have to reach out. We have to at least give them some sort of advice. We can't leave them for their transgressions, because if you leave them and to their transgressions, society will fail. Wallahi, it will collapse. And this is why uh, the Prophet ﷺ says in the hadith that any time a, a community abandons inkar al-munkar, which is forbidding the evil, or at least, you know, demonstrating to the people, hey, what you're doing here is wrong. If they stop speaking out like this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will soon destroy all of them. Because there's no hope for that society anymore for correction. We have to have people who are willing to at least speak out and say, hey, look, what, what is going on is wrong. And so this group, they tried to correct it. The third group told them, لِمَ تَعِذُونَ قَوْمًا إِلَّا هُمْ إِلَّا هُمْ مُهْلِكَهُمْ أَوْ مُعَذِّبَهُمْ عَذَابًا شَدِيدًا why? Why are you guys wasting your time in talking to people who are clearly wrong and they're not going to heed your advice? They're not going to listen to you. Why are you wasting your time? And today you'll find people who say this. Don't waste your time talking to those crazy people. They're crazy. There's no way that they can be corrected. Don't waste your breath. And uh, by the way, this happens on both sides. <laughs> Where they tell you, don't waste your time in, in reaching out. What did the people do who were actually trying to reach out? What did they do? What did they say? They said, first off, we're doing it so that we have an excuse to Allah, to our Lord. We have an excuse in front of Allah that at least I tried to do something. I tried to reach out. I tried to make sure that this rift wouldn't grow. Maybe they'll be guided. I don't know. Guidance is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we don't try, then for sure they're not going to be guided. For sure, yani if you do not try, for sure they're going to remain unguided or misguided. But at least if you try, you can say, you know what, I at least tried. And by at least trying, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually saved all of them from being punished. And therefore when the punishment came down, it only came down to the people who transgressed specifically. Because if you look at the other villages, the other towns who were destroyed, all the entire town was destroyed. Why? Because it was destroyed at a time when there ceased to be people who were at least trying to correct the wrong. When it was only the Prophet who was trying to correct, and then he left, that's when Allah destroyed them, because he was the only one. But as long as there were people there who were trying to correct the wrong, or at least give some good advice, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected them from being destroyed, all of them, and only destroyed the people who 
we're actually committing the wrong. And this is why we have to do our job in at least reaching out, building these bridges instead of bur burning them down and trying to correct and trying to give sincere advice. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He makes us among those who are able to give sincere advice. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He unites our community upon truthfulness and upon guidance. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us for our shortcomings and our sins. هَذَا وَاللَّهُ أَعْلَمْ أَقُولُ قَوْلِي هَذَا وَأَسْتَغْفِرُ اللَّهُ لِي وَلَكُمْ فَاسْتَغْفِرُوهُ إِنَّهُ هُوَ الْغَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Amma ba'd. The question now remains, how do we give good advice? How do we give sincere advice? This, of course, can, you know, we can spend a lot of time discussing it. I'll give very brief bullet points, inshallah ta'ala, to this end. Number one is to actually ask questions, to be, to inquire before you accuse. Because at the end of the day, you don't know why the person has decided to do what they've done. You don't know why this person has decided to back this candidate or that candidate or this policy or that policy or whatever is going on. And by asking them, sincerely asking them, why did you do this? What's your reasoning behind it? You'll actually be surprised a lot of times. You'll find out that not every supporter of this man, for example, is xenophobic or racist like he is. You'll find that every man who supports this other guy isn't against family values and isn't, you know, a heathen or a liberal or whatever it is that they label the other side. You'll actually be surprised and you'll find out that they're still human beings and they have their reasonings and we have our shortcomings. But by genuine inquiry, now here's the thing, the Prophet ﷺ demonstrated this multiple times. He would see the Sahaba, the companions do something wrong, yet he would inquire, لِمَ فَعَلْتَ كذا? Why did you do this? He brings Uthman ibn Mav'oon radiallahu anhu, great sahabi. He was one of the first people, if not the first person buried in Baqir, righteous man. But Uthman was doing what we call tabattul, which is forbidden in Islam, where he basically secluded himself for worship to where he became like a monk. And becoming like a monk in Islam is haram. What did he do? He said, I'm going to fast every day, I'm going to pray all night, and I'm never going to get married. All three. Remember there's a hadith of the three individuals who came that was later on. Early on, Uthman himself was doing all three. <laughs> because he was, you know, he, he didn't get married and whatnot. And so the Prophet brings Uthman and he says, Balagani ya Uthman, and kafalta kada wa kada. He says, I've been told, this is what I've been told about you. Is this true? And Uthman said, yes. And the Prophet then asks him, why? Araghibta an sunnati? Are you, do you want to do other than my sunnah? He says, Bal sunnah taka arqab. You know, your sunnah, following your example is what I want to do. And then the Prophet clarifies, he says, no, you misunderstand. So it turns out that there was just a simple misunderstanding. And a lot of times you'll find that that's the case. Genuine inquiry, not accusing the individual. Because as soon as you accuse the individual, it'll turn them off. You won't be able to have a good conversation. Avoiding ridicule. A lot of times in our, in our discourse, and I am guilty of this as well, we tend to ridicule the other side. But by ridiculing them, we only push them farther away. Wallahi. And study after study has shown this, and our own Qur'an, our own book tells us to avoid this. To not curse their gods so that they do not curse Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala adwan bighayri ilm. It says, do not curse their gods, because otherwise it'll put them off and then they'll start cursing yours. And this is why if you look, the Prophet's rhetoric was never one of ridicule, was never one of showing them how, you know, because if you think about it now, sitting here, Alhamdulillah, looking back and at people who worship idols, we think, how could they do that? That's so ridiculous. Right? It doesn't make any sense. You see somebody worshiping an idol and you're like, what the heck, this guy is an idiot. But of course, in his mind, he's justified it. He's worked through all of the kinks, and for him, this is completely normal and natural. So even though you think that the other side are just full of crazy people, they've actually worked through a lot of this. And in their mind, it's not. And if you just start from the get-go by saying, oh, you're crazy, 
There's, you can have no conversation. Another thing is to not do it in public and to do it in private on one-on-one. -on -one, one -on -one. And this is extremely important when you're able to have a good dialogue. If you can avoid doing it online, avoid. <laughs> of course, with the pandemic and everything like this, this might prove to be a challenge. But if you can have a good conversation in person in which you can show empathy, you can see the person's emotions, you can hear their tone of voice, you know where they're coming from. For a lot of people, their decisions are actually emotional based and they are not actually intellectually based. You'll find that the intellect has nothing to do with where they stand. And this is why if you can have that conversation in person, and we know this from so many examples from the Prophet ﷺ. When he initially declared prophethood, yes, he did it in public. But after this, if you look, almost all of his da'wah was exclusively one-on-one. -on -one. He would talk to the individuals. And when you have that one-on-one -on -one conversation, you'll find that coming to common ground is so much easier. But hiding behind your keyboard, posting anonymously online, this does not help anyone or anything, unfortunately. And it only leads to more risks. That personal touch is needed. There's many other pieces of advice. Give advice in the way that you would like to receive advice. Many of us feel very uncomfortable receiving advice. And we have to analyze this. Why is this? Why am I not willing to hear the other person? And just like I would like to hear, and I have to think, okay, if, the, if I want to receive advice, if I know that I'm doing something wrong and I want somebody to correct me, how do I want him to do it? Then I need to project the same way. Be gentle non-accusatory, inquire, be sincere, because at the end of the day, the word nasiha itself means to be sincere, to be honest. And if we cannot be honest with, you know, with one another, then of course we have no hope for doing this nasiha. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He enables us to accept and receive nasiha insha'Allah ta'ala. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He unites our community. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He keeps our community safe and the entire city and state and United States that we live in, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He guides us and guides through us and makes us a cause for people to be guided as well to the truth, Ya Rabbil Alameen. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He forgives us for our shortcomings and our sins and enters us into Jannat al Naim, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Ibadallah, inna Allah wa laikatuhu yusalluna ala nabi. Ya ayyuhal ladhina aman wa sallu alayhi wa sallim wa taslima. Allahumma salli wa sallim wa baraka ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad. كما صليت وسلمت وباركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد اللهم أعز الإسلام والمسلمين وأذل الشرك والمشركين أعداءك أعداء الدين ربنا اغفر لنا ذنوبنا وإسرافنا في أمرنا وثبت أقدامنا وانصرنا على القوم الكافرين اللهم لا تدع لنا ذنبا إلا غفرته ولا هما إلا فرجته ولا دينا إلا قضيته ولا حاجة من حوائج الدنيا والآخرة إلا قضيتها وسرتها برحمتك يا رحم الرحمين ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار عباد الله إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعظكم لعلكم تذكرون أذكر الله يذكركم ولذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون وأقم الصلاة